She won most talkative in high school, and she has been running her mouth ever since. Welcome to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast with your host, Lisa Fisher. Okay, I've got the OGs. That's what the kids say when you've got the originals. It really is a term that isn't something we would say now. Original gangsters of the low-carb movement. But you two are really, after Dr. Atkins, you are the names that people think of when we start talking about low-carb. And your book was the high-protein, low-carbohydrate way to lose weight. Feel fit and boost your health in just weeks. What? How did you find this? And how did you know it was kind of the holy grail? <laughs> Gosh. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's a, a, a question to unpack. Yeah. How did you find it, and how did you come to know it was the Holy Grail? Well, I, after having been thin all my life, I suddenly, I mean, really suddenly, just out of nowhere in the space of what seemed to be just a few months, I all of a sudden packed on a lot of weight myself, and, uh, and then it just kept coming, and so I... Uh, was in a busy practice you know we had a busy primary care practice in in Little Rock and uh, I just kind of kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and so then I went on first one of these whatever the current fad diet was I don't even remember what it was now and I lost some weight and then it came back and and you know it just went back and forth and then I decided that um uh, instead of being a generalist, I, th- I always thought, you know, I'd kind of like to specialize in something. So I thought, you know, why don't I treat my own obesity? And so I delved into the literature a little bit, and I started noticing that, um, uh, you know, that everything that made you gain weight kind of ran your insulin levels up. And I started charting out what insulin did. I broke out my old biochemistry textbook and charted out all the insulin pathways. And it it dawned on me that if somehow you could get insulin down, you wouldn't store as much fat and you should lose weight because that's what happens with type 1 diabetics. They have no insulin and they end up having these just incredible weight loss that, that without trying. And that's what brings them into the doctor's office. They say, Doc, I've lost 30 pounds in the last two months and I haven't done anything. What's going on? And, or more likely, I'm eating like a horse. Right. And, and usually yeah. that's a tip off that they probably have developed diabetes. And so... I thought if you could, if I could lower insulin levels, <clears throat> I could solve this problem. And then I asked myself, how can you lower insulin levels? There really aren't any drugs that do that. And what drives insulin up is carbohydrate intake. And so what's got to bring it down is to reduce the carbohydrates. And so I did that and lost weight pretty easily. I had to change my diet to do it, but lost weight pretty easily. And then patients started seeing the change and said, what are you doing? And I told them and the next thing I know, my kind of part of the practice morphed into a weight loss practice, and it, mm-hmm. and then we just decided to write it up in book form. So that was about it. And what year was that? That would have been about 1985, 84, 85. And, uh, well, the book didn't come out until 89. Yeah, the book didn't come Well, I wrote a book called Thin So Fast that came out in 89. Right. And that was the first foray into writing about it. And then Protein Power came out in 96. Mm -hmm. We were going through a a whole huge deal then with selling a clinic and all that. And somehow the manuscript got lost. At the the publisher. At the publisher. And the publisher was not calling us. Usually they're right on top of you because they've given you an advance and they were, yeah. hey, what's going on? Where's the manuscript? Mm-hmm. And uh, the, I'd lost the editor that we signed up with had left and gone to another company. So they assigned us a new editor and there was just mass confusion. Then they fired that editor and then somehow our manuscript got lost. Uh, the, the sort of the manuscript in process because we were sending it bits at a time. Actually, it was my manuscript yeah, and I was doing it by myself. I wasn't myself. involved at the time. And and it, it got, as I say, it got lost at the publishers, and I was glad because we had all this stuff going on, trying to negotiate the sale of our clinics and moving into a new practice that was kind of weight loss and, and mm-hmm. metabolic only. Yeah. And uh, and so I was thankful that I hadn't heard from anybody. And then all of a sudden, out of blue, out of the blue, I get a call from the new editor and says, "Hey, what's going on with this manuscript?" <laughs> Where have you been? What's happening? So that kicked us back into gear. And then Protein Power came out in 1996. With this boat. With this boat. Oh, well, then while this was going on, we ended up getting a new agent 
the new agent said, let's, you know, let's rep this to other companies. And so we went to New York and, and had a, uh, you know, went from publisher to publisher. And they said, why don't you both, I mean, you both do this. Why don't you both write the book and be co-authors? That was fine with me. So off we went, especially since I'd written about half of it. So it was going to be left to her <laughs> to write. write the other half. <laughs> Good. <laughs> to write the other half. Uh-huh. Good thinking. And so it kind of let me off the hook. And anyway, that's how it all came to be. Now, remember, um, in Little Rock, you had opened a practice. Was that on Bowman or Autumn Road? Uh, neither. Well, there was one on, but we had what we originally started was a chain of uh, what started as one, and it became four of outpatient urgent care centers called Medistat. Right, and right. The, one of those was on Cantrell. There was one on Bowman Road. There was one yeah. out in Dyer Springs, and there was one over in North Little Rock. And um, that was the chain that we sold. And when we um, developed just our weight loss and metabolic practice, that was over on Anderson Road. So uh, at Out Cantrell and off on Anderson Road. Oh, right. Okay. I just remember this because there was chatter about it because, you know, um, my people just, you know, on camera, everybody's trying to lose weight. That was one of the options. But you also had Diet Center. You also had Weight Watchers. You also had Jenny mm-hmm. Craig. And now we know that those are full. I mean, a lot of those are just full of. I mean, literally, you're eating. I mean, not literally crap, but your your, your diet is crap on those <laughs> things because it was all yeah. about packaged foods. Right. And yeah. you were the first people that weren't saying packaged foods. You you know, I remember people saying, "Just eat ter- turkey breast all day." And of course, it's much more than that. But mm-hmm. what were some of the first kind of that. things <laughs> that you uncovered that you thought this is really a good fit for me in what you ate? Okay. Say that again. I didn't exactly understand the question. What were some of the things, like when um, Dr. E, well, you're both Dr. Eats, I'm sorry, Michael, when he started saying, I, I'm going to have to lower my carb intake, what were some of your first choices that you were looking at to eat that were high protein and low carb? Well, it's so simple for him. <laughs> steak and steak. and Right. He, he would eat steak. All day long, every day, he would have no problem with that. I'm the one that gets kind of burned out on steak, but I would have gotten oh. burned out on turkey breast, too. I mean, I just yeah. I have to have some variety, but he would happily have steak and a salad every night, uh, and tomatoes, mm-hmm. every night. That's I, I don't even have to worry about that. That's very simple. Well, we had lamb, and we, well, we had, had chicken, and we had all kinds of... But not because of you. <laughs> me. No, I like lamb. She's the one that didn't like lamb. She's come around there. I have come around. I have. But that so, was mainly the main switch. It was almost to a carnivore diet, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. just because you know you can't go wrong that way. No, <laughs> right. I'm, as far as I'm concerned, you can't go metabolically fact, wrong. No, right. I'm texting my husband now, reminding him that I I've got the steaks and the sous vide that we'll have for a late lunch, and for him to fry the pork rinds. I mean, mm-hmm. when you, you know. when you eat meat based, it's really simple. I have not, I get bored easily, but for some reason, the satiety is so good and mm-hmm. so delicious to have a ribeye mm-hmm. every day and maybe oh. some pork rinds because I do miss the crunch. I will say that's mm-hmm. the one thing I miss. Yeah. And Here, so, singing my song with ribeyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's his I could eat it every day. Mm-hmm. And you just about and, did. And not go wrong. You know, what I've noticed because I adopted more of a meat-based ketovore. I mean, we might have avocados or I think the nightshades like personally bother me, so I've kind of removed those. But um, my satiety is so high eating beef, right? Those Mm -hmm. hunger and the satiety hormones, the leptin pushes out, the cholecystokinin pushes out, you know, all these things magically. But I noticed that the last couple of nights, because we're recording this in November, and so it's already uh, social eating, and so mm-hmm. in my social eating, my daughter's birthday was the other night, and mm-hmm. we had some carbs with that. I had some carbs last night. Mm-hmm. And it's the first time since July that I've gone back for seconds because the carbs don't give me the satiety mm-hmm. that a ribeye steak will do. Have you all noticed that? Oh, oh for yeah. Sure. For sure. Not only do they not give you the satiety by themselves, they override almost the satiety of the ribeye itself. So you have the yeah. ribeye, and then you have the, the piece of birthday cake or whatever, yeah. and then you're you're off. And, and running and hungry again and it's um 
it's an odd effect. And you really notice it if you're, say, at a restaurant and you've gotten some delicious big chunk of meat that you're gnawing away on and you finally kind of get it finished and somebody says to you, hey, uh, try a piece of this swordfish. It's really good. And you go, uh, uh, really, I can't eat another bite. Then they come around with the dessert tray and you say, hmm, oh, well, uh, maybe I can't eat another <laughs> yeah. bite. Yeah. Because your, even your brain knows that carbs are going to override this satiety yeah. effect. So they do override it. Mm, absolutely. Mm, that's really interesting. And it, absolutely. It make, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so you started realizing what um, the researchers now have told us, Dr. Ben Bickman wrote, Why We Get Sick. And, you know, he's a metabolic researcher, and it's all about insulin, not even glucose. So we right. used to chase this rabbit trail of glucose, and Dr. Bickman so beautifully said that um, insulin has a 10 to 20-year predictability on your health. You know, it will blow out long before the glucose will signal anything because of the body we're, you know, mm-hmm. fearfully and wonderfully made. And then mm-hmm. Dr. Fung has noticed it so Y'all were saying this in the 80s. Did people think you were nuts? Uh, I thought we were killing people. Yeah. <laughs> oh, because of cholesterol? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yep. uh, and and both Ben and Jason are good friends of ours. Mm-hmm. So we... Uh, oh, I bet. You know, we go back and forth with them a lot. Uh, the, uh, But yeah, back then, people did think we were crazy. In fact, the Arkansas Times came out to do an article on us. And they were just a cover article. A cover article, and they were just all sweetness and light. Mm-hmm. And they came out. Oh, they were so excited about everything. And then when the article came <laughs> out, it was just a total hit piece. Oh my gosh! And one of the the sub headlines was, "Are these doctors killing people?" In big bold letters. In big bold letters. Are these doctors killing people? And Did you know, hire a lawyer? Huh? Hmm? Did you hire a lawyer at that point? No. Yeah. Okay. No, because. Everybody, all of our friends, all the people, ah, oh, I saw your article in the Times. That's so great. I thought, did you read it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, you didn't read it. You no, didn't even read the right. headlines. Are right. these doctors killing people? Yeah. So people don't, you know, as they say, spell the name right. Right. So how did you know? Because the heart health hypothesis is that, talk about crap, has been around for a while. So how were you, because I remember in TV, we were in the 80s. In fact, when I worked at Channel 4, there was a big push for low cholesterol. They told us to mm-hmm. stop eating shrimp and lobster mm-hmm. and remember to eat margarine. Mm-hmm. And so that was at the same time you had uncovered the Holy Grail. So then how did you push back? And I, your patients didn't die. They lost weight. They lowered mm-hmm. their insulin. They lowered their risk of disease. Yeah. Well, what... it. When we first started working with all this, um, we too had bought into this whole cholesterol hypothesis. And, but what we discovered in practice is that a low carb diet really lowers cholesterol. Mm-hmm. It doesn't raise it in most people. It kind of normalizes it. Now there are a subset of people that it does raise it on, mm-hmm. but the vast majority of them would get their cholesterol lowered. So we thought that the low-carb diet was great for lowering cholesterol, so it didn't bother us that we put people on on uh, meat and eggs mm-hmm. and cheese because we saw people's cholesterol go down, their LDL go down, their HDL went up, their lipids changed in a uh, in a positive direction. If and, lipids actually matter, yeah, yeah, which they may not. actually but, matter. And mm-hmm. Right. Now, the point that I don't think they even matter at all, but at the time, we were using that as a way to treat uh, lipids that were out of whack and it worked really well and then with people who, who had their LDL go up uh, with those people we would do uh, a special test that was kind of expensive I and mean, we asked them about it and if they wanted to go for it we we did it that, that measures the particle size because even it's at pretty that common time, now but back yeah, then it yeah. was at that mm-hmm. time it was, uh, people were realizing that if you had big fluffy LDLs those were actually uh, a good thing. They were helpful versus a small dense. And what we found out on these people who did have their cholesterol go up, and the ones we did test on this, is they had all switched from a small dense to the big fluffy mm-hmm. type. Mm-hmm. And triglycerides are really a pretty good marker for that. And if your triglycerides go down, you can be pretty well assured that your big fluffy 
LD, the, your LDL converted to the big fluffy kind, uh, even if they go up. So mm-hmm. it wasn't problematic. And so yeah. we really got to the point that we didn't worry about it at all. And as time went on, uh, we got more and more uh, comfortable. Became more and more <laughs> with the opinion that lipids really don't matter. <laughs> I have to say, the first few patients was a little bit of a, uh, what would you call it? it, a little bit of trepidation. Yeah. Oh, because a couple sure. of them were really, really high. There was a, a w- one woman, and she actually came in to see me uh, at the Cantrell Clinic, where I was the head doctor there, and she had right upper quadrant pain, all the signs of probably um, uh, gallbladder disease. Right. And, and so I started to work up on that, and when I got her lab back uh, on that, it was just it was non-fasting, but still, her triglycerides, I think, were 3,200 or yeah, something like that, 3,200, um, mm. like 3,200, and I was just, and she was not that overweight, I mean, she was, a, a, you know, a little thick in the middle, but she was not overweight, really, and, you know, mid-30s, late-30s, mm-hmm. yeah. and oh, wow. I was just, oh, my gosh, um, and so I ended up sending her, well, A, to have her gallbladder ultrasound and all the stuff she had to have done, done, mm-hmm. but then over to his clinic, for him to look at this in in terms of the diet, and because she didn't want to do medications, she was concerned about the medications, and she wanted to try to do something naturally, and so uh, I ended up sending him uh, her to him, and he repeated her lab fasting, and it was worse. Mm-hmm. It was like thirty five hundred or yeah, something was, like that. It was, it was a, a, a huge triglyceride number. And uh, he put her on the diet. It was a little trepidation. Said, "Go home, eat. I want you to eat meat, cheese, and salad." Basically, is what he told her, and eggs. And he had her come back in two weeks. And she came back in two weeks, and her triglycerides were normal. Yeah, normal. I mean, it, which it, was like one eighty or one fifty yeah. or something like that at the time. Yeah, <laughs> she had she'd made so. an incredible improvement, and it was strange because in a in a just a short period of time, I ended up with four patients. That had, she was the first one, but four patients that had really bad lipids. And I put all of them on the diet. Mm-hmm. I stressed mightily over it because mm-hmm. I could just see myself in court. <laughs> having right. the, uh, you know, the plaintiff's attorney said, so are you telling this jury, Dr. Eads, that you took this person who was a middle-aged male and likely to have a heart attack and already had high cholesterol, you put him on a meat and cheese and egg diet. Is that what you're telling this jury? I mean, I had bad dreams about that. (laughs) Uh, So I watched all these people like a hawk. and But these four came in. Three of them were uh, females, and one of them was a male. And the male was a middle-aged male. It was a guy I knew. He'd come in to get an insurance Mm -hmm. physical. And he, uh, you know, he came in and we chit-chatted a little bit. And he said, uh, you know, what can I do about this belly? And he had kind of a little pot belly on him. I mean, a little pot belly. Yeah, and I told him about the program. And so he said, okay, and he takes off. And then I get his lab work back, and his lipids are absolutely horrible. Mm -hmm. Not as bad as hers. Not as bad as hers, but remember, this was a time. Like 1,700 triglycerides or Yeah, and this was a time when I had bought into the whole lipid hypothesis. Right. And I saw that and I thought, holy cow. And I wasn't too worried about the women because women don't really have heart attacks that often, uh, especially well, when, they're pre- when they're premenopausal. Right. right. But he was a male and mm-hmm. he was a middle-aged male mm-hmm. and he was in the high-risk category mm-hmm. in terms of age and, and gender. So I put in a call to his office and they said, oh, he's gone on vacation. He went on a cruise. And I thought, oh, okay, no, he's he's on a cruise. He's not gonna. <laughs> he's not gonna follow. He's this not diet. gonna follow this guy anyway. So I'm not worried. <laughs> right. About it. And so I said, please have him call me as soon as he gets back. And so he gets back from this thing, and it's 11 days later, and he calls me. What's up? And I tell him, and I say, uh, what, what's the deal? How what are you doing? He said, hey. He said, I went on a cruise, but I had access to everything in the world, and I stuck to your diet, and I've lost about five pounds, which is unbelievable on a, on a cruise. cruise and he says and i feel great and i told him what his lipids were and i said you got to come in we we got to recheck these and he came in and 11 days later they had totally normalized that gives me chills i, I, I mean truly i know and so that gave me confidence to mm-hmm. uh you know to to push on with this as an actual 
lipid lowering therapy, not just a weight loss therapy. Mm -hmm. And we saw that pretty uniformly. Mm -hmm. And as I say, occasionally people would have their LDL go up, and then we measure for particle size. Uh, mm -hmm. and, that and there is this thing um, that uh, Dave Feldman is uh, honing in on, yeah. which is uh, the lean mass hyper-responder phenomenon. And so there are some you know, athletic, young, lean people who will end up having their, um, their LDL go up, their total up. cholesterol go Way pretty up. pretty yeah. high. And, uh, you know, that's been a real concern in some quarters, but at, he was one of those, I mm. think. And so he's studying that very carefully, and, you know, it really looks like it's, it, it's an aberration, but it's probably not something that's dangerous to these people. But, you know, it's hard when your cholesterol goes that high with, the rest of the world telling you you're going to drop dead, it's uh, it's hard to um, to stay firm. Well, <laughs> okay, so explain to me the science. Uh, why then? Because I'm an intermittent faster, and so if mm -hmm. I have a lo I've done like a five day fast, and a five day fast I had to have because I do bioidentical hormone replacement. She had to check it. It was like at week five, and that's kind of this pivotal week, and I was in the middle of this five day fast because of. I, my GI doc thought I might have had an adenoma polyp. I did not. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I'm heading it off now, right? I was going to try to get all this autophagy in. And he came back and said it was benign. I was fine. Not to see him in 10 years. So clearly it was fine. But I was like on day four of this fast. Um, and it wasn't fun. Like I was not doing cartwheels <laughs> like some people say that they get this second win. No, my glucose was like 52 that morning. Yeah. Now my fasting insulin was 1.1. But... My, I will say my cholesterol was up, my LDL, all the bad ones were up. Now, my mm -hmm. provider doesn't hassle me in that. But explain to me, is my the liver's pushing out cholesterol, right, mm -hmm. during the fast. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. During then, yeah, right. every day of your life, yeah. Okay, every day of your life. But I, I was reading, I don't know if Bickman said or somebody, or I've heard him say that, but during people who have these longer fasts sometimes, he mm -hmm. said you will, he goes, the, the liver's doing its job. So for those people who came in and had extremely high lipid panels on a higher carb diet, and then once they went to fat and protein, then what switches? Does the liver then back off? Is it making more during the high carb intake? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it can make more during fasting because <clears throat> when you eat fat, it's, you know, it's absorbed through the gut. Uh, it goes into what's called the the, the lymph system. And right. It goes in the lymph system. It dumps out in the thoracic duct, uh, and 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 then it goes throughout the body, and then the liver starts dealing with it. But when it gets absorbed, it gets absorbed as as, as <coughs> chylomicrons, uh, which are little fat-containing substances, and those travel through the blood. They go to the fat tissue. The fat tissue extracts fat out of it, the muscle can extract fat out of it to be used for energy as it needs it. I now, see. The liver makes LDL. The LDL doesn't come in through the diet. The liver makes the LDL and it also is a, tra a fat transport molecule. Mm -hmm. it's okay. And it takes it, the carrier molecule that takes it out to the tissues. So if you quit eating, then the source of fat for your body is manufactured fat, mm -hmm. and that's manufactured in the liver generally, um, and, and and turned into VLDL and then LDL, and it travels around. So it would make sense that if you fast, that your LDL level is going to go up. And this guy named Dave Feldman, who's an engineer friend of ours, um, who's done a lot of work on this, probably more than anybody more than else. Anybody, yeah. And he's God only knows how much blood he's drawn on himself. <laughs> on himself. Because he was, uh, <laughs> Surprised he has he any was, left. He was his first test subject because he had really high LDL levels. And so he started experimenting with everything. As I say, he's an engineer keeping meticulous mm -hmm. records. And he found out that if you really want to lower your, your LDL level for a, uh, uh, a blood test you're going in for, all you have to do is two or three days before that eat a huge fat load mm -hmm. and that will drop your LDL because yep. your liver is, doesn't need to make LDL to get it out. Mm -hmm. Got it. So if you want to keep your doctor off your back, that's what you need mm -hmm. to do about, oh, you need to go on a statin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
the, and, uh, the ribeye caps. Yeah. That's what you need to eat <laughs> for the three days before. I, I want, I really, I, I almost, want, I'm not going to have you repeat it because people can stop their device and back it up. But that is the most solid advice, most sage advice for anybody. I've even heard Dr. Fung, Megan Ramos, who's part of her, uh, mm-hmm. his Institute of Dietary Men or IDM, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. I heard her say two to three days of fat load, but she told us hardcore intermittent fasters, she said, simmer down on your fasting and only do 13 hour fasts for mm-hmm. those three days. Mm-hmm. And now you're explaining. I didn't understand why, but I know mm-hmm. I've told. I am a certified health coach. I don't give medical advice, but I can tell people how to take their labs that are not just glowing, but representative of their true health, mm-hmm. and so that to keep a provider off their back. But that totally makes sense to me, and I will, I will use that advice from this day forward. <laughs> um, you know, most people, if they're if they get a high number like that, they get scared by their doctor and they're going to you know, have to go back in and get it repeated and invariably what they do is that they go way low fat because they think they're doing the right thing and they end up getting a worse number. Right. And, you know, so it's it, it's totally counterproductive what they try to yeah, do. That is they, so yeah, fascinating. Then they panic and, mm-hmm. what, and then they end up what, on a statin. Yeah, what can, which are as far as I'm concerned absolutely worthless mm-hmm. drugs. Could, mm-hmm. could you repeat that please? <laughs> that statins are worthless drugs. <laughs> uh, Thank in you. In my opinion they're <laughs> worthless <laughs> drugs. Yeah. Thank you. And opinion of so many cardiologists that I've interviewed. Mm-hmm. So many that I mm-hmm. mean. And uh, another book I'm reading right now or a book I'm reading that has maybe the cholesterol myth or one of I'm listening to it on Audible and the author is saying that the most lucrative drugs on the market for the provider, for the healthcare companies, for Pfizer, for whoever, are the statins. So right. it's the right. same thing I said yeah. the last couple of years. Just follow the money. Right, mm-hmm. exactly. Right. Yep. And if you look at all the, yep. the statin studies, the the ones that were decently done, the early on ones that they spent tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars doing, uh, what they ended up showing was that statins brought about no... Uh, Decrease. No change, no decrease in all-cause mortality. I mean, the reason that you take a drug is you don't want to die, okay? Right. right. And, and statins didn't make any difference in all-cause mortality, uh, except in one small group, and that was men under 65 who had had a heart attack already. And even that was a negligible yeah. change. And, in fact, you know, people who study public health wonder if it's even worth the money mm-hmm. for the tiny handful you had saved to put all those people on stands, mm-hmm. which not so much anymore, but used to be really expensive drugs mm-hmm. until they went off patent. Mm-hmm. But the uh, uh, but there's no no change in all-cause mortality, which means you're just trading one risk factor for another. Right. Now, it is true that, you, that people that are on stands have fewer heart attacks and mm-hmm. have fewer fatal heart attacks, but it's compensated for because they have more cancer, they have more other kinds of problems. So there's right. there's really no change in, in the your risk of dying at any given any given time. And so that's why I think they're kind of worthless drugs because they're not particularly benign. They're not they can, benign. They can no. increase liver cancer. That's why people that are on them have to go back in and get all these blood tests mm-hmm. all the time. They can cause the rhabdomyolysis. Short-term, yeah, rhabdomyolysis. They, they can cause short-term memory loss mm-hmm. uh, in a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, these aches and pains from the, right. the rhabdomyolysis. And it's just, uh, I just don't think they're very good drugs. I think and, they're but, terrible drugs. But every time you pick up a medical journal, there's some new purported benefit for mm-hmm. statins. People don't do as poorly uh, with COVID if they're on stands. I mean, it's just one of these yeah, things Yeah, but it's probably about the same another. as if they took a baby aspirin. Yeah, and so it's... Uh, I think that those have made a fortune for the mm-hmm. pharmaceutical industry and not mm-hmm. done a lot for the patient population. And not a get, lot of harm, actually. And you know, I write a weekly newsletter, uh, and I get you know emails back from people with just these pitiful stories mm-hmm. that you know, one guy, my 92-year-old father, um, had a stroke, and, and so they put him on stat. They want to put him on statins. What do you think? Well, I can't give specific medical advice. Right. You know, over the internet. Um, you know, my mother's 83, and she's uh, her doctor wants to put her on a statin because her LDL is up. I mean, it's crazy. 
I mean, there are a handful of studies out there showing the higher the LDL, the greater the longevity when you're mm-hmm. elderly. Mm-hmm. You know, they've studied elderly people, and those with the highest, the higher LDLs live the longest. Same thing with women. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, what I mean. Same thing with women. And mm-hmm. so it's just, uh, it's insane. That, In fact, um, that all-cause mortality, Nature.com had a study that the highest all-cause mortality was had the lowest cholesterol. The highest risk yeah. of dementia had the lowest cholesterol. So, yes. right. and, and you know, think about cholesterol makes a big portion of your brain. I mean, right. there's a lot of cholesterol and fat that, that is structural in your brain. You know, without it, no brain. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the argument that what I call the lipophobes <laughs> have <laughs> to that is that they <laughs> say, well, it's, it's not that the lower cholesterol is causing the decreased longevity, is that these people have something the matter with them, and that's mm-hmm. making their cholesterol too low. And there's probably and that's so, probably fair. Yeah, uh, it does happen oh, with cancer or right. whatever, because the cancer cells are gobbling up the cholesterol to make new oh, cancer cells, because that's structural for the cell wall. I mean, cell membrane. Um, you know, so it, it does happen that way. But I think it's I think it's both things. Yeah, you know, and LDL is a part of your immune system, mm-hmm. an important part of your immune system, mm-hmm. and people often overlook that. And one of the strongest validators, I think, for the lack of any truth to the lipid hypothesis is people that have uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. And this is a sort of a genetic screw-up that gives them really high cholesterol. And they do tend to die younger, when they're younger. These are people that can die at 22 years old from a heart attack or 17 years old from a heart attack oh. and they find that they've got this and they've got these huge high cholesterol levels but the ones who don't die end up living longer than people that don't have is that right yeah, familial hypercholesterolemia yeah they uh they have greater longevity and so it's um you know i just don't think there's a lot to uh, the whole lipid hypothesis mm-hmm. of heart disease. Mm-hmm. I think it's more of a uh, a clotting disorder. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> but if you're saying too, so the fat would help you with the clotting, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the lack of carbs helps with the clotting yeah. too, because the when lack of carbs goes up. All of the clotting factors uh, go in a clot direction. So, yeah, there's a guy that's done a lot of work on this in the UK. He's also a friend of ours named Malcolm Kendrick, and he's got a new book out called The Clot, the Clot Thickens. Thickens. <laughs> and he's, kind of, yeah. and he's kind of a he's tongue-in-cheek a guy, kind yeah. of guy, a funny guy, but he's got a big practice in the U.K. Mm-hmm. and a really smart guy. And funny. funny, <laughs> funny. Now, you two are retired from your day jobs, but it sounds like you're still active in medical research and especially because I know you know Dr. Bickman, Dr. Fung, and you're still in those circles. Because, again, you were saying this before anybody. When people are right. saying calories in, calories out, you're saying, mm, not so fast. Mm-hmm. So were, were you practicing? You were practicing then in lipids, when lipids were introduced. Right, right, right. And what what was your, did you have a reticence, a pushback about it then, kind of going, this isn't making sense? Or did you buy into it because you wanted to get paid by the insurance company to see that patient. Uh, hmm. No. Well, we never no. really did a lot of that. Yeah, no. I'm, Good. We bought into it because... Well, coming out of school, it was just right. starting... When we right. were getting out of med school, the whole lipid idea was just sort of getting started. But to tell you how long ago that was, normal cholesterols at that time, when we were in med school, if I was going to take a test, they would say, what is a normal... Cholesterol, yeah, three fifty. That was the upper limit. Are you serious? Considered normal, and humans haven't changed a whole lot. Apparently, they have. Um, (laughs) But that was that was what it was. And then no idea bringing it down, bringing it down, bringing it down. And now you'll see people in this. Oh, we want to get your LDL under a hundred. I'm thinking, are you nuts? So my total cholesterol is two hundred and five. Right. Well, my doctor wants me to go on a statin. Our son, who is fifty, this year. Um, our middle son um, got some blood work done, and his cholesterol was 205, I think. Mm-hmm. And his doc- doctors recommended he go. And he is he's thin and he's healthy, and nothing wrong with him. 
just based on that with a triglyceride that was low, they were going to put him on a statin, Ridiculous. and he looked at him and said, no, <laughs> no, you're not. And it's, you know, it's insane, too, because one of the things Dave Feldman showed in all his work is that uh, cholesterol bounces all over the place, mm-hmm. and you can't go to the doctor one time and get a, a cholesterol test, and you know, a lipid panel, and say, oh, my God, you need to go on a statin, because mm-hmm. it could change three days later, mm-hmm. depending on what you eat. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's... I mean, everybody kind of understood that about triglycerides, that they were very volatile, but people back in the day assumed that cholesterol was kind of a stable thing, and it's not. Dave yeah. Feldman has shown that. It really is dependent on what you eat, and it could be a totally different number tomorrow. And, that, and yet, all of these tests that they, you know, I mean, these studies that they do, and they say lowered cholesterol by 10 points, and you think, that's, so, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I mean, you can't, well, it, it, it could be situational. That's, there's not enough change there to show and, anything. And when I got, uh, when I started working with all this, I actually uh, believed the experts mm-hmm. and right. believed the medical literature. And now I've found out that it's so screwed so up screwed and so up. flawed. Mm-hmm. And, the, uh, and you really, really, really got to be careful in what you draw from it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've got to read these articles critically. You've got to, I mean, I used to just pull these articles and I kind of read the abstract and read the conclusions. Uh-huh. I think this that's what most doctors do. Proves this yeah. and that. Mm-hmm. And you, you've got to delve into it. That's why when people say, what do you think about this paper? And it's a 12-page paper. You know, <laughs> and it's going to take me three or yeah. four hours to go through right. that, look at the methods, try to figure out what they did, try to figure out what, if mm-hmm. anything, they, they left off. Mm-hmm. Uh, to Where really biases re- might yeah, be. to really read it critically mm-hmm. uh, it takes a long time and you just find out so much of this stuff is just absolute garbage mm-hmm. and, and and so now I'm I've gone the other way I'm totally skeptical of everything <laughs> whereas early on when I started doing this you know I believed it all and I believed the lipid hypothesis until mm-hmm. I just finally got smacked in the face with after seeing <laughs> many well, thousands of patients that it, Really and we have, to, we have to see that big pharma and big food are kind of even in bed together. Remember, it wasn't it Cheerios that told us that if you ate that, you could lower your cholesterol? Lower your cholesterol. A high carb. Mm-hmm. I mean, Cheerios mm-hmm. is sugar. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's carbs and sugar. It, nothing mm-hmm. about it. I think it was Cheerios, one of the cereals yeah. that said lower your cholesterol. Soluble yeah. fiber in it. Yeah. And so, therefore, it's oat fiber, and that was in the days of the... Um, what was that called? Six week cholesterol cure, eight week cholesterol cure. Yeah. Yes. Eight week cholesterol cure, and everybody was making oat bran muffins and scarfing them yes. down because that was going to help them lower their cholesterol. That was yeah. that was a phase, and that was a phase because all it did was increase your fasting insulin and your blood mm-hmm. glucose, right. which and in then turn <laughs> affected the other things. So you and know, what kept your cholesterol down was the niacin mm-hmm. that they recommended. Mm-hmm. Which, that was also part of the program. That was the program. You'd always oh, want yeah. Who doesn't want to eat muffins? I love a brand muffin. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, I'd be face down in a box of them yeah. if I didn't think there were any consequences, yeah. but there are. Yeah. And that's what the guy who wrote that book was basically giving people permission to do. Hey, mm-hmm. make these big fluffy muffins and eat them all day long and your cholesterol will go down. Oh, and by the way, take these large doses of niacin that are going to make you flush. Uh, mm-hmm. Or take the no flush niacin that's turned out to be problematic, and I think it's even been taken off the market. Mm-hmm. So it's um, it was sort of the the drug slash supplement that was doing any cholesterol lowering, and the muffins were working in opposition to it mm-hmm. because obviously so, he didn't understand the physiology of where LDL comes from. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, we'll go back to your in the '80s when you were practicing, and you were saying, you know, we've got to push more protein. And now we know more fat. Were you then, because everybody was counting a calorie then, were you all counting calories within your high protein? You weren't then. Then people did think that you were crazy. Crazy. Yeah, we just, we just, (laughs) you know, for the most part, uh, if you count carbs instead of calories, uh, yeah. You won't overeat because the foods that you do get to eat are so satiating, you, yes. you really don't overeat. Mm-hmm. It's strange, though. Some people can. We would get these letters that I just found amazing. These people would write to tell us how closely they were following a low-carb diet. And they were eating this and they were eating that. And 
And, you know, I did only eat 10 grams of carb a day. And when you add up everything they eat, it was about five or 6,000 calories. And oh. they said, well, I'm not losing any weight. And I would think, well, And this was a female, this yeah, letter, right. was, a, was a woman. I would say, does it not amaze you that you're eating that many calories and not gaining weight? Oh, that's and, a good way to look at it. Yeah. Well, and, what, could, what was she eating, though? She was just eating... Because you get so well, satisfied from if you... She, she was eating fat. three things that sabotage most low-carb diets, which are nuts, nut butters, and cheese. Mm-hmm. Because oh. you can cram a ton of calories into those without getting very many carbs. And so people will eat those to weigh excess. And the whole thing about a low-carb diet is, is what it does is it lowers your insulin levels it basically opens the doors of the fat cells so the fat can come out and be burned, which is what you want to have happen. Okay. But if you're eating enough dietary fat that you don't have to burn any fat, even though the doors are open, it's not going to come out. You're not going to necessarily gain weight. Yeah, the amazing thing is that you don't okay. gain weight doing that. But you won't lose weight. How, how did she not reach satiety then? I, nuts. Yeah, that's I think, really I mean, I think that's what you're what you're talking about is exactly that. There are some people that oh, have okay. such a high okay. a, a ability to not be satiated yeah. uh, that they they can just eat and eat and eat. And um, I mean, I remember reading that letter. It's when we had our clinic up in in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I was just I said, you won't believe what this woman's eating. I mean, it was just a you know, it was like three eggs and five pieces of bacon and whatever for breakfast. And then she was Uh having, um, you know, a a whole six, you know, ounce can of tuna with mayonnaise Uh and I'm not sure why. And then she, I mean, just eggs in in the middle of the day. I mean, just all of this food and then the big steak at night. And, you know, and yes, she was keeping her carbs 10 grams, but she was eating just a tremendous number of calories. And as a result, she wasn't going to lose weight on that. She, she was maintaining weight on that. But, you know, I thought, golly, it's like double what I eat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and our middle son, the one she was talking about earlier, who's thin, but he's actually started putting on a little bit of weight because he doesn't pay real close attention to his diet. And so he's just flipped the switch and kind of went cold turkey on a low-carb diet. Well, on a basically carnivore diet. Right, on a basically yeah. carnivore yeah. kind of low-carb diet. And so he's sitting there one night watching TV and he's got this, you know, one of these big things like you get at Costco of uh, uh, cashews. Ca- no, yeah, but cashews. It was cashews. cashews uh, and, which are kind of a high carb nut. They're all yeah. fruit, not a nut. But uh, <laughs> yeah. anyway, he's sitting there and watching TV and he ate half of that thing. Of that, that Half huge. of that giant thing. So it's really easy to do yeah, yep. when you're eating nuts yeah. yep. and you're just I see. You know, with the salt and you're crunching them, yeah. blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he went through it and I said, take a look at the calorie count on that. <laughs> right. And it was astounding. Oh, he, he had probably eaten, I don't know, 3,000 calories yeah. just sitting watching a movie. And So there is a time, and Dr. Fung says we can't outrun the thermodynamics of the the equation of you know, you could eat too many calories. I guess mm-hmm. most of the people I deal with don't really face that. But I, I can see how. But if I'm also hoping people aren't eating a bucket of cashews. Right. right. Me too. Right. Me too. And he's not now. Yeah. Now that we, uh, we informed him. Informed that. him. But so. You, you know, but you can, you know, you can crank up and crank down your calorie burning, too. Mm-hmm. And I see. Well, without thinking about it. I mean, if you go on a really low calorie strict diet you're going to burn a lot fewer calories your, well, you get your metabolism cold. just drops right, off get you, cold. You, right. you, all you don't move as much when you around, sleep you, you don't have you, you know you don't have a lot of meat and so yeah you conserve calories mm-hmm. and on the other hand if you just chow down on a lot of uh, low carb calories You'll burn uh, it. and don't run your insulin up mm-hmm. you end up cranking up your energy expenditure mm-hmm. just innately I can see that you know, um, we saw that with patients in the clinic too. When once they got, I mean, the first thing we did was uh, when somebody would come in was, you know, talk to them about the diet, how it worked, you know, what was happening with within them, you know, when they eat uh-huh. protein, when they eat fat, when they eat carbohydrate, because I wanted I wanted them to understand um, that it was all in their control, that what they ate had this yeah. impact that they were not yeah. going to escape, and they got to yeah. pick what it was. 
And there's a, a real power in that, I think, if you feel like, okay, I, I really do have control of this. I can, I can make this decision. But then they'd get on the diet and get squared away. We didn't even talk about exercise or anything, just said get on the diet. And spontaneously, after they got on the diet and their insulin started coming down and their weight loss started, they would, they would spontaneously, they'd come in and they'd say, I joined a uh, you know, square dance club. or what? I mm-hmm. mean, they suddenly decided they wanted mm-hmm. to get out and be active because they had all these extra calories that they didn't need that they were going to burn off, and they needed a way to burn them off. But we didn't even really have to tell them to do it. They just did it. Aren't our bodies interesting like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you think, think about animals that go into hibernation, you mm-hmm. know, how they're not expending the calories and that there's mm-hmm. the intake has dropped. Mm-hmm. Yet they're provided, you know, they have the provision to make it through the long, cold winter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then um, like I've that. even I've even heard some doctors saying now that and that's one thing I love about fasting for me is that um, I'm at my probably the weight my body wants to be. Mm-hmm. I'm five, eight, about 150. Yeah, I was 140, 35 years in college, 40 years ago, mm-hmm. I was 140. But, you know, I've been through menopause. My thyroid is not impressive. A lot of <laughs> autoimmune condition. Yeah, she, she died. She yeah, RIP to my whole thyroid. She's just burned out. But all that to say, uh, Dr. Kiltz in um, upstate New York says the people who make it through the long, cold, hard winter or through cancer or through disease are people with a little fat on them, too. Mm-hmm. That this isn't that's why it's not a diet. It's where my body Fits right. my, you know, my clothes fit well. I'm right. slim, you know, yeah. but I'm not skinny. That's the point. I'm right. not skinny. And I think fasting, if you eat and, you know, part of intuitive eating, and I know that that gets thrown around too much, but I think our body just kind of, there's a hand in glove where it fits and goes, okay, this is just where you're going to sit. This is when you need food. This is when you need to stop. And so that's mm-hmm. one thing I think fasting has done for me is it has helped. And Dr. Fung has helped explain that my satiety signals and eating a high fat diet like steak is mm-hmm. so satisfying mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so what what is your philosophy then on because intermittent fasting is obviously not a new term it's an ancient term but mm-hmm. in the last 10 years dr fung michael mosley some others have said you know i think if you stop eating <laughs> as many hours in the day you might lose some weight what, what did you think about that when you first no, heard it well, i wrote about it about 15 years ago i guess <laughs> Is that uh, right? Can, yeah, about intermittent fasting. <laughs> and it, uh, because I started reading the literature on it that was just coming out of the NIH mm-hmm. by a guy named Mark Matson who did a lot yes. of work. Yes, oh, yes. And the thing that, uh, and, and, you know, when you look at it with rodents, um, you can, you know, you can take rodents and give them food ad libitum. They just eat all they want. And then you can crank it back. Or their litter mates, basically, sort of genetic similar rodents. You can crank that back by 30 or 40 percent and give it to them uh, just one time, and and or I'm sorry, not do that. You can give them the same number of calories, but just yeah, give right. them once a day or once right. every other day, right. and they're going to lose weight. They're going to their health is going to improve it's all over the place. But the most important part to me was that it increased. Uh, BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotropic factor, which makes you increase connections in your brain. It's thought to, uh, you know, to really, it, you can't give it to people. They have to make it themselves. But people right. who can, when you can induce it, uh, it makes people better with Alzheimer's. It, you know, makes you smarter. It makes rats be able to figure out mazes better. It's, uh, it's good stuff, and it's hard to get your body to make it, and you make it with exercise, and you make it with intermittent fasting. And so that's one of the things that I like the most about intermittent fasting, and we pretty much intermittent fast all the time. Just we never, we kind of never eat at the same times, and we'll go till 4 o'clock without eating one day, and then, you know, the next day mm-hmm. eat an early breakfast. It's just right. random all over the place. Mm-hmm. And so, and I think... Well, and sometimes we do it kind of structured. Yeah. You know, we'll do a um, a thing where, you know, we'll eat a breakfast and a lunch and a very early dinner if we're going to do that, and then we won't eat again until 6 o'clock the next day. That's so fabulous. Then they'll get a 24-hour fast in mm-hmm. that... There, you know, never a day without sunshine. Yeah, then the next day you, you get big dinner and breakfast mm-hmm. yeah. and lunch the following day and do it again. Mm-hmm. But we're all over the place. Yeah. And, the, you know, the most, uh, 
the most efficient machine is one that's operating at a steady state. And so if you, the more you alter things, the less efficient your machine becomes. Right. And less efficient in terms of human means burn, burning, burning more, more calories. calories. <laughs> right. And so that's why we like to vary stuff around all over the place. Mm. Right. Our bodies like that. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, yep. every, with yep. snacks in between, you know, right. all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really think our bodies like to guess as to what the fuel source is. Plus, you show mm-hmm. metabolic flexibility yeah. because mm-hmm. you come in and out of sugar and fat burning, which is, mm-hmm. again, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, how do you handle, because we're in the holiday season, when that stuffing is in front of you or the cake, what do you do? Do you have special occasion days or no? Sure. Yeah. Sure. And holidays are, are generally those, although uh, I, I went to totally gluten-free 10 years ago. Oh, great. On um, the, pre, the, the understanding that it's probably not very good for your heart, uh, that gluten's probably not for inflammation. And, right. Uh, I have a strong family history for heart disease, and so I, I went gluten-free 12 years ago. And so that's changed a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the rest of the family didn't go gluten free, and when Thanksgiving comes, right. they want gluten stuffing, and yeah, they, right. I mean, mm-hmm. well, we still don't, I still don't do it with, you know, I do a I do a stuffing that doesn't have gluten in it, so I could wow. have it if I want to, yeah, um, but I, and I'll have a little of it, but you know, it's a friend of ours, rest his soul, Robert Crayon, uh, once said, "Pleasure is a nutrient," and he's right about that. That <laughs> if you deprive yourself forever. <laughs> Yes, you know that that takes a toll too, and so every now and then, uh, and I think in protein power we called it stumbling into the honey tree. Every now and then, <laughs> you stumble into the honey tree, and okay. and when you do, you get drunk on honey. And that's what early man did. Yeah. And they got drunk on honey and and stumbled away. And, yeah. Uh, but you know, it wasn't something that you did every day. And I think that's a big problem nowadays is that people just sort of live in the honey tree and they're yeah. never out of it. Right. In high levels of insulin and other things. Mm-hmm. And it, it, there's a reward mm-hmm. system that our, our brains have. Okay, let's wrap things up. Mary Dan, you all have turned from nonfiction writing. You have now switched <laughs> into fiction writing. I didn't expect this part. <laughs> well, I want to go ahead and give props to you because well, when I looked for you on social media, because I remembered your names and when I, I, I've just, I mean, you can, I hope you can tell that I've done my research on fasting and autophagy and all the things. Like, I'm fascinated by the science. Your names keep coming up, but when I go to your site, it's all about the new and improved you. Now, Michael <laughs> still is sassy on Twitter, and I love what he's saying about on Twitter. I don't want to say yeah. it here because I don't want the no. you know to get, get pushed off. Don't get him canceled. <laughs> well, you, you sadly, can. I <laughs> you canceled. That's right. But I'm I'm tracking with you all on your Twitter. But Mary Dan, tell me what you've been doing. Uh, well, um, as so many people during COVID, I needed something else to do. And I uh, had a, back years ago, I remember we were walking down the street in New York City with our agent and talking about the protein power book that was that yeah. we were selling and all of this. And I had written three books for her, I think three or four, um, for a book packager that she was doing that were, that were um, topical, breast cancer, arthritis, um, vitamins, um, eating disorders. And anyway, I said, you know, I'd really love to write fiction. And she says, "Well, if you're going to write some fiction, you should write you should write a story about a lady doctor in the rural South because that's what you know." And I thought, "Oh, okay, that sounds kind of good." So I actually got started on that and wrote a couple of early chapters of it. And then, you know, life intervened, and protein powder intervened, and then all these books that came after protein power, and and our practice, and a, a thousand things, and I never got back to it. And then during COVID. Um, for whatever reason, I thought, well, I had my sister and I had actually taken that story and turned it into a screenplay back around wow. 2000. Oh, my. And, um, and, and, and it didn't sell. But, you know, and who were we? We'd never written a screenplay before. We did it as part of a class. We took a class at the Santa Fe Screenwriter School. And, and in fact, we did two classes there, two summers. And so then um, I had this screenplay and I had this beginning of a book. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to go back and I'm going to actually finish this book. I'm going to turn this book into a novel and get it done. And so I did and got the, you know, the, the whole thing uh, finished and it was published in May. And then um, I decided it was going to be a series. And so the second one just came out the 17th of this month. So it's now a two book series 
And I'm and what, hoping, are, what are the titles? I'll put this all in the show notes, too. Oh, okay. Uh, well, the, the series is titled The Catabend Series. And the first book is called Catabend, which introduces the lead character, Maggie okay. McKinley. And the second book is called Eye of the Storm. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love what you're doing in that it's so encouraging that you haven't hung up. You may have hung up your stethoscope, but you haven't hung up your brains, your desire for life, <laughs> your interest in things. Well, that's what keeps us young, you know. Yeah. True. Oh, absolutely. That's true. Right. And, and, I, and through this character in these books, I get to practice medicine, which is really kind of fun because she's a family doctor. And I so love it. I, all these cases that were from both our case book, they're all anonymous, but right. the things that we encountered or whatever, now I get to... I get to practice medicine again, but without paperwork and without, you know, bills and the hassle. Well, I need to take a break from all the fasting and sciencey books I read, and I would love to jump into that and just escape. So I think it's a great idea. (laughs) Thank you both for being here. Great job. Thank you for, do you have Arkansas roots? Is that how you started in Little Rock or you went to med school? Born and raised in Hot Springs. Okay. And then we practiced in Little Rock forever. And yeah, he was from and what Missouri, city are you just over the border? Yeah, what city are you in now? Uh, right now in Dallas. We're oh, okay, split in between Dallas and Santa Barbara. Right. And you're in Dallas, where my son's there, and he's complaining how it was cold the other day. I would oh, be in Santa Barbara cold, then. Cold, bad cold. That's what he said. Cold. I was like, yeah, "Where's the literal?" Like Twenty-seven said, yeah. degrees or something like that. It was cold. Yeah. yeah. It was cold. yeah. yeah. He said it was really cool. Okay, great job, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast. Be sure to hit subscribe and download all the episodes and leave a review, won't you? The Lisa Fisher Said Podcast is produced by ClantonCreative.com.